Hi, Lunel. Thank you so much for sitting down with us for Hype Plus today. My name is Tina Sampe. I'm a journalist from South Central. And yeah, I'm just so excited to talk to you today. How awesome. You Great to talk to you too. Definitely, definitely. So um, you're a local here in Los Angeles for people that may not know. Uh, you, you reside in the Crenshaw District? Yes, I do. Proudly. What, <laughs> what influenced your decision to make um, this area your home base? Budget, (laughs) (laughs) because I have lived in the valley. I have lived off of Mulholland. I've lived off of Magnolia and NoHo. Mm -hmm. Um, But uh, through circumstances, I ended up in a studio apartment Mm -hmm. in the Crenshaw District because I had a friend who had a friend. Okay. And I just stayed there. And then I got a... I, I came into some money mm-hmm. and got out of the studio and got into a house that was only four blocks away, but kept the studio. Nice. And at the time, my daughter was living in the Bay Area, but that's when I got the house. She was able to come and stay back with me. And we. And then when she went to college and she came home, she went to the studio. She didn't come back home with me. <laughs> so she's four blocks away, and we remain in the Crenshaw District, you know, for, for the time being. Nice. Definitely. Definitely. So I know I heard you mention in an interview once that, um, you know, your Excuse your plans, me. your yeah. plans is to buy a house soon, you know, and you, you don't want to go to Beverly Hills. You want to move to Baldwin Hills. Can you talk to um, the viewers a little bit about what is the significance for you of living in Baldwin Hills as a black woman in Los Angeles? There are many reasons why I chose that area. First of all, um, I'm already acclimated to the surrounding areas. I have relationships at stores and this and that. Mm -hmm. Second of all, it's um, still staying true to my area, but being a little bit elevated, a little bit, you know, away from the the brouhaha, so to speak. It's also a very famous area. A lot of affluent black people have lived there. They used to call it the Black Beverly Hills. They still do. Lots of doctors and lawyers up there. And, of course, uh, I can Tina Turner lived up there. And um, I believe Ray Charles used to live up there. And it's a really beautiful area. So when you pass through the Crenshaw District and you have to pass by the Marathon Clothing Store, um, what feelings come to mind for you when you see that it's you know still boarded up three years later after Nipsey Hussle was murdered? I sort of have a little hood PTSD, actually. Mm -hmm. And it makes my head want to explode every single time I pass there. I remember so much. I mean, I've shopped there. I bought the $100 vape there. All my marathon gear is from in there. It's such a historic site now for such a horrible reason. It was on its way to being a historic site for another reason. And I remember all the people... If you can imagine 50,000 people on the corner of Crenshaw and Slauson, I remember the funeral procession. And that's the thing about me and my life and my career, is I can get dressed up and put on all the jewelry and the shoes and the bag and the lashes and the makeup and go to Hollywood or Beverly Hills and go to a fancy event and red carpet and schmooze and have open bar and eat finger food. But then I come back over the hill and I have to pass that. Mm. So it like, I can never get affected by the Hollywood hype because it's like every time I come home, I get slapped back into reality again by passing the marathon store. And it's just uh, tragic. What would you like to see um, the site be moving forward? Well, I wouldn't like to see them tear it down because the building itself has a look and has memories. And I think that we're going to go up. I think that we're going to build a living facility going up. Right, high-rise apartment. And yeah, and I would like to see the Maybe the stores, some stores reopen. Maybe they would sell marathon gear there again. 
And of course, it wouldn't be a fish market and stuff. Now it'd be more like a Starbucks and a, you know, Chipotle or whatever like that. Cleaners, which they were going to have anyway or did have. And um, if there was just a way to keep it safe, if there were a way to keep it safe and not, you know, vandalized or anything like that, that's what I would like to see. I'm not sure what they're actually going to do, though. Okay. So another thing that I wanted to ask you real quick about Nipsey is, um, you know, we have this problem in America where, you know, it seems like the brightest minds, uh, black males are just like cut down and cut short, you know. So I know that's an issue for me personally when I think about um, his death. Um, What is something that bothers you the most about Nipsey Hussle, what happened to him, his passing, just... What bothers you the most about his his tragic ending of his the tragic ending of his life? Sorry, it was so senseless. It was by somebody he had had slight association with in the past. Somebody had been at his face. Um, I think it was actually just good old fashioned jealousy mm. because Eric Holder didn't really have a lot going for him. And yet the little girl he was with that day was clearly fawning over Nip, had taken a picture and was and had posted it, I believe I heard, and was so enamored with him that whatever he had in him before just boiled over that day. Not to mention the fact he just happened to have two gats on him. Um, It also bothers me that the very sacred ground that he had stomped over and treaded over and been arrested on and came up from selling tapes on the street to acquiring a building to employing convicts who were having a hard time finding a job and making a product that people was wearing proudly in that district, which had been so thrown away. Right. Those are the things that hurt me. Let's talk a little bit about Oakland. Um, a few weeks ago, you published these black and white photos uh, where you were f- photographed by uh, Miss Tracy Bartlow, um, Oakland, circa 1996. And um, people just love those photos. I know I shared the photos and like you were just looking real fly, um, young, style In the streets. In the streets of Oakland. At a bus stop and in front of a club and walking down the street with my baby. Hmm. They were, they turned out to be, and especially sometimes black and white mm-hmm. can make a different impact on you than color even. It reminded me of those pictures you used to see in like Life magazine and stuff like that. And we didn't really know it at the time that they would really be such important pictures to me, my daughter, the community. So I'm really proud of those. And it took me all these years to get, I I had one photo from that photo session, but now I have many photos from that photo session. And Tracy came to Los Angeles and had blown up a couple of the photos that I have at my place and my daughter has at her place now. And she also has a place in Oakland called Be Loved to Guest House, which is filled with artwork, pictures that she's taken over the years uh, in Oakland, California, showing like the different times and progression and stuff like that. So I'm proud to be part of, of that exhibit with those photos. When you think back on, you know, you, an up and coming, up and coming comic in Oakland, What are some of the things that come to mind the most when you think about that time? Well, at that time, this is pre-social media, the camaraderie of the comics, the hustle and the grind that we had. You know, nobody was flying anybody anywhere at that time. If you 
had something that you wanted to go do in LA. It's like four of you got your gas money, you get in the car and you go. So the hustle was real. And the drive, like we had made determinations that we were going to get the hell out of here. And that we wanted, I didn't want to just be the girl in Oakland. You know, I had worked every place in the Bay Area, Oakland, San Francisco, Berkeley, Sacramento, San Jose, uh, all of that. I had done it all. It comes a point you're either going to get out and go somewhere else or you're going to end up just going around the same Ferris wheel and being that chick there. But I knew I wanted international attention is really what we want and fame and for people on a bigger scale to hear what I had to say because I always got something to say. So um, there used to be a lot more clubs open. They used to be black owned. Mm. And uh, so I missed a lot of that stuff. So do you feel like black owned clubs was an easier space for young black comics to kind of come in and get their feet wet and, you know, get on stage and things like that? I think black clubs made it easier for all comics because all comics can come to the black club. All comics can't go to the white club. We let Mexican comics come in. Lesbian comics come in. White comics come in. We're we're, we're we're more like, oh, you think you got it? Let's go. Let's see. But the white clubs, you have to really work your way into those. Now, luckily for me, I might have cut my teeth in Oakland, but I was actually raised in the suburbs of Oakland in a place called Castro Valley, California, which was very, very white. So I got a good education, but all my livelihood was in Oakland. But being that I was had like both worlds under my belt. My comedy has always been, uh, I don't want to say crossover because I'm very underground still, but it's always been to where it doesn't, well, let me see. It's been to where my audiences have always felt comfortable being mixed. You know, I have a, a very diverse crowd everywhere I go. That wasn't by design. That's just the way it is. I didn't seek out to, you know, impress Whitey. I just did comedy and so and still do. And white folks, black folks, you know, trans people, everybody can relate to the stuff I talk about. I believe. So Oakland, um, you know, it's a very diverse area, the Bay Area, but also Oakland is you know, the home of the, of the pimps, you know, shouts out to the two shorts. Um, well, two, two shorts. The Mac was filmed in Oakland. The Mac's filmed in Oakland. During the Superfly era, but it's also the home of the Black Panthers. It, right. So there's that. And, and so many entertainers, you know, you mentioned short. We have, you know, in Vogue, we have Tony, Tony, Tony. We have the Edwin Hawkins singers. We have Sliding Family Stone, Grand Central Station, Sheila E., you know, it goes on and on, people coming out of Oakland. Have you ever had any crazy encounters with a man who thought he was a pimp in Oakland, you know, with that being like um, a theme of Oakland? Have you ever ran into any crazy pimps, crazy men try to finesse you? Yep. <laughs> I actually hold for like two weeks. Okay. But I was, I was hold for two weeks. I met a guy named Freddie, who is probably dead. Freddie's dead. Okay, Freddie. So he's probably dead. Maybe Freddy. he's not. R.I.P. if Freddie's dead. But he was super good looking, long Ooh. hair, you know, very pimpish. <laughs> and I don't know, he convinced me to do some stuff. And I did it, but there was a couple of things that I didn't, do. One was I did get busted immediately because I was not a hoe by trade and I uh, I thought your pimp was supposed to come bail you out. That's the way it was in the movies. Right. Come get your girl. 
but he didn't. But I had enough money on me to bail myself out. So I went back to the house and he was sleeping in the bed with the white hoe. Not the white hoe. The white one. I'm sorry. So I my career ended because I stole the gun, the dope, and the money and got out of Greyhound and went to LA. Oh. Is that how you were able to purchase your bus ticket by uh, No. Okay. But it all happened. I didn't purchase nothing with that. Okay. All right. I just took it. Okay. So would it be safe to say that that ended your journey of being a hoe for two weeks? Yeah. Because he didn't come and That's rescue right. you. That's right. R- Freddie, mm-hmm. why did you leave Lunell hanging? Why, right, Freddie? Damn it. <sighs> Sorry to hear that. Sorry Me to too. Hear that. So, but it's a blessing because I might have still been a hoe. Who, who knows? <laughs> right. Because I was good. Okay. I bet you was, Miss Lunell. I bet you was. So something that was in the headlines recently, speaking of you know pimps and hoes, is Sugar Free recently announced that he is getting married or he's engaged. Do you think that that is something that is acceptable in the pimp culture, marrying women? Well, sure. Look at Ice-T. I wouldn't say that Coco was no hoe, mm-hmm. but she certainly was hoeish looking. You know, <laughs> the white girl with the body, yaddy, yaddy, and right. all this stuff. And she looked good on a pimp's arm. But she also has turned out to be a really great girl, a really sweet girl. I know her. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, an unexpected late life mom. And, and they're still together and they're still great. And she's a writer. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that for Sugar Free, it hurts my heart because he is the ultimate, you know, pimp player, P- Pomona. Right. And all that. Uh, that's like too short getting married. It's like, excuse me. <laughs> But we're all getting older, and Short has a baby, and Sugar Free has the right to lope down with somebody. In the words of, of Lizzo, it's about damn time. Mm. You know, uh, you're not going to be in them streets. It's not the game. It's not 1975. You're not really a pimp. You're really a, a musical artist. And, you know, let's separate fantasy from reality and go on. He, he can get married. I'm crushed, though, you know, but okay, I'm definitely. glad for him. Let's talk a little bit about cancel culture. Um, as a comedian, did you ever think you would see the day where people are so focused on controlling what people say? That's what it, it seems like, is that if what people say is not in alignment with the acceptable narrative that we're all talking about, then people are, are criticized. Um, and I feel like as a comic, you know, is that an interesting space to be in? Um, so yeah, when you see people being criticized for their thought processes and comedians like Dave Chappelle, you know, being criticized for his jokes, did you ever think that you would see a day as a comic, um, that you would ever see this day, sorry. Well, let's go back. And cancel culture has always been here. That's why Lenny Bruce got arrested so many times for not saying what they told him, for saying what they told him not to say. They've tried to cancel, you know, Dick Gregory. They've tried to cancel Paul Mooney. They, You know, cancel culture has always been here, but whether it sticks or not is determined by the love of the people. Cancel culture only applies if you, in fact, can be canceled. If you have done so much and have been beloved for so long and have been doing the same thing for all these years and speaking the same way for all these years and all of a sudden some fad of unknown people in the internet have control of your destiny, um, I'm not buying it, you know. Even if I were to be canceled by a certain section of people, there's other sections of people who ain't going to cancel me. Right. Like my family's not going to cancel me and my friends are not going to cancel me. You know, I'd have to do something horrendous 
rather than just say something that somebody don't agree with. I don't think there's a comic out there who's not said something that somebody don't agree with. You can't please all the people all the time. The key is to stop trying to do that. I'm not trying to please all the people all the time. I'm trying to stay true to my authentic self and speak what I feel. And the people who come see me know who they're coming to see. And the people who are new are usually brought by somebody who knows who they're coming to see. And the people who come see me who didn't know who they're coming to see, they have all the freedom in the world to get up and walk out the door. Nobody's holding you with a gun. That's, you know, why, like when Paul Mooney would take the stage and every now and then there was, you know, couples get offended and walk out the door. He just laughed about that because if you lose two, three people, but you've kept like 300, like who cares? Chris Rock was recently criticized um, by Ebony Williams, who um, she says that, you know, she went to one of his shows and she was offended because it was majority white people from her perspective. And Chris Rock was on stage saying that he's black, but he ain't a nigga. Right. Um, How do you feel about that? Do you think that black comics, there should be like a code that, you know, black comics are on that doesn't disrespect black people as a whole or do you kind of just you know give them free reign you think well i mean i know what he's talking about <laughs> <laughs> we all know the difference but sometimes i think there's comedy that should be like only for us that we don't really say in front of them but uh where can you do that at because while white folks can get away from black folks Black folks can't get away from white folks. You know, white folks can move to communities where there are no black people. They can go to bars where there are no black people. They can live a nice white life if they choose to. But there's nowhere that black people can go and get away from white folks, even in Watts or Compton or anything like that. You know, um, I think that Chris Rock needs to realize he is, in fact, a nigga, just like the rest of us. Let the police get a hold of him on the side of the road, and he'll find that out real quick. You know, mm-hmm. somebody might say, oh, my God, that's Chris Rock. Let him up. Let him up. And another person might say, I don't give a damn if that's Chris Rock. Let's beat his ass. Mm-hmm. Why do you think people gravitate towards towards you so much? You know, you just hit um, a million followers on. A million plus. A million plus on Instagram. Um, you know, you're doing your YouTube. You're constantly engaged online. You know how you mentioned canceling. There's sectors of people that would never cancel you. You know, like, why do you think people are drawn most to Lunell's personality? I think that I was thinking about this the other day. I think that I'm somebody that people pull for. The people who have known me for years have seen the struggles that I've been through to even be where I'm at, wherever that is. I think that I'm funny and refreshing and sexy and crazy and knowledgeable all at the same time. I think that the people know that I really am down for my people and women and kids. And I'm vocal about it and I don't hide it and I don't bite my tongue about it and I get involved and I do things. And I'm really just more about the people than I am about the corporate thing, which might have held me back in my career, if you want to call it held back. But I can sleep at night. You know, I'm not selling my soul. I'm not playing that game. I'm going to... I've been in the game long enough now where I know the rules, but I am going to have certain things my way. Or I won't. If I never get any further in my career than this, where I'm at right now, I'm still eating. My daughter's still comfortable. And, you know, that would just be what it is. Do I have bigger plans than just doing stand-up in clubs and occasional arenas and working with, uh, you know, some iconic people like Chappelle and Cat Williams and stuff? Yeah, I got, I want to be the next black woman in late night. You know, this white boy thing, it's got to end. (laughs) I feel like I'm in snowfall every night when I go to bed because it's just white man after white man after white man after (laughs) white man after white man. No Latinas, no women. And so I've had sisters in late night before, but I feel like they haven't had the right one. Mm -hmm. I think that I've got the thing that will tap into the zeitgeist of people at that time of night. I don't want to do daytime. Don't. 
want to learn how to make Christmas wreaths out of toilet tissue rolls. I don't want to sell detergent. I don't want to talk to lifestyle analysts and all that crap. Mm. I want to do exactly what I want to do. I want to talk to who I want to talk to. I want to ask them what I want to ask them. I want to have real liquor on set, just like Johnny Carson them used to do. Okay. And um, the YouTube show I did during quarantine, Hey Lunell, yes. I used to do live every Wednesday from the house and from the, stu- the other studio we have out there in Sherman Oaks. Mm-hmm. And uh, we got 63 episodes that are up now. And this started, my show started before the Ahmad Aubrey murder. Mm-hmm. So it was lighthearted and cool, and we were learning how to do YouTube. Mm-hmm. And then everything started going straight to hell with the racial unrest, the Black Lives Matter, the murders, you know, everything like that. And that shows in my shows as well. If someone's to binge watch, you know, you can binge watch me. It's like you can binge watch Bridgerton or anything like that. Mm-hmm. And if you were to watch me, watch those, you would see it go from a happy place to like a dark, radical place. And then I realized, I said, these people are looking at me to cheer them up. So let me try to pull out of that and bring back a little joy and sunshine. Mm -hmm. So I have that, you know, very active on my Instagram, at Lunell. They'll put it at the bottom, I think. Mm -hmm. Uh, At Lunell on my Instagram, I do lives and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. I... uh, I'm in, uh, as of November, Sunday, November 6th, I'll be resuming my residency in Las Vegas at the Jimmy Kimmel Comedy Club. That's amazing. Which only stopped March 15th of 2020 because that's when they started to shut down Las Vegas. It wasn't like I was failing or anything like that. It was the Rona. So I'm very excited to be getting my residency back and being one of the few black stand-ups, female for sure, that's out there. And, um, you know, Vegas hasn't always been good to black folks, but I'm in there. Mm -hmm. And if I'm in there, then that might lead a path for other folk to get in there, you know. And once you get in there, you can, if you do it right and you do your job and people come to see you and you bring in numbers, you can work, you know, in Vegas and stay in Vegas doing different things. There's a million opportunities out there. Vegas used to be the place where people thought, oh, washed up entertainers went to to die. (laughs) But it's not like that because Usher ain't by no means washed up. And he's killing it out there. Bruno Mars ain't washed the hell up. And he's out there. That's his second home. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Anita, I think, might be out there soon. And, you know, we've got a lot of black people working in Las Vegas. My daughter's a dancer. There's thousands of dancers in shows out there. And so there's a lot of opportunities in Vegas. You know, um, you mentioned, you know, your residency and things like that. And, you know, for people to know what's going on with, you know, our favorite icons and celebrities, they have to be promoted. They have to be doing interviews. They have to, you know, they just have to be out there. And um, something that I see uh, a lot is I see you on Vlad TV uh, doing interviews with, with Vlad. Um, and for Vlad. And for Vlad, too. So can uh, what... Can we talk a little bit about like how maybe that started and why um, that is something that you choose to do? Well, he reached out to me to do an interview. I did it. Kept the 100 like I always do. And the numbers were great for him. Then he asked me again. And then he asked me again. And then he asked me again. Because the numbers were good and people were interested in what I had to say or at least curious enough to watch. You don't have to be interested. You don't even have to like it. But if you watch, you're going to get the view. So um, then um, some finances started coming into play. And then he gave me the opportunity to do interviews because I, I have experience in that. And uh, then, of course, I brought some people to interview that were my friends. I brought Tiffany Haddish, I brought Chaka Khan, I brought Miguel Nunez and Kelly Price. So I brought those people and, um, you know, it's just an opportunity. Mm-hmm. That's all. I don't have any um, 
uh, beefs with anybody about him. I don't have any beefs with him. And I don't care if somebody has any beefs with him until he do something to me. Um, people have their opinions about him. People got their opinions about me. I know that the job that I do is entertaining, or I feel like it is, or I've been told that it is, and I get to learn something about some of my friends as well. So that's all it is. Do you ever see anybody like trying to criticize you at all for like supporting a platform that uh, people have said to be problematic? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And how do you like respond to that at all? Or you just kind of I don't. You know, people talk about, oh, I'm getting cyberbullied, I'm getting cyberbullied. Well, you really can't get cyberbullied if you don't read it. Like, there's people who might be saying stuff about me now. I'm not, you know, because I've got a lot of content on the gram and my thing is always popping up if somebody's got some comment about something. Well, every time it does, I don't go check to see what they said to, you know, and I don't, I go back every now and then and see, you know, some new comments or whatever like that, like anybody else who's curious, but I don't. Sometimes I put stuff up, post it, and never even go back and look at it. <laughs> I feel you. You know, it's for the people, it's not for me. Are you clear about why some people have issues with Vlad? Like, do you understand that criticism at all? Yes, I do. And, um, that's, uh, their opinion, and you, the numbers don't lie, so whatever their criticisms are, you sort of got to watch it to criticize them, and that's all anybody cares about. Do you watch? You have to watch to know what you're talking about or who he's interviewing, and a lot of these people that he's interviewing, some people think are a waste of time, but other people, they don't have a platform. They're not going to get on CNN and be able to talk. They're not going to go on, you know, the Jennifer Hudson show and be able to talk. But there is a platform for them to talk. And a lot of these young kids follow these entertainers and want to hear what they got to say. So he gives them that opportunity. You know what I'm saying? People can say, oh, Vlad takes advantage. You can't be taken advantage of unless you let yourself be taken advantage of. And the people that go in there, ain't nobody holding no gun to their head. They walk in there, they sit down, they open their mouth, and they run off at the mouth on their own. <laughs> right. You mentioned your Vegas residency begins, uh, starts again on November 6th. Yes. That's a Sunday. Mm-hmm. And um, let's just talk briefly a little bit about the things that you are, you know, working on and featured on right now. You're doing the show Hacks. Hacks on Hacks. HBO Max. Okay. Right. Um, I think the documentary Fat Tuesday is still on Amazon Prime. It's an amazing documentary written and directed by uh, Guy Tory, and it tells the story of you know the black comedians that came through the comedy store. During a certain era, it's an amazing documentary. I'm so proud to be affiliated with that. Um, doing some voiceover work, uh, working on a documentary that some people are interested in doing for me, which subsequently would have the book after that. Nice. Um, trying to shoot some projects that I have had on my mind, like, you know, because the uh, in this day and age, you really can't just go to people with ideas no more. You really just need to shoot it and let them see it. Because a lot of times they can't see what you're trying to explain. So that takes money and time and cameras and this and that. And, you know, you got to spend money to make money. So I'm willing to invest in myself. I'll bet on myself every time. So just doing stuff like that and touring and I'm supposed to shoot my one and only Netflix special at the top of next year produced by Dave Chappelle like I said and uh, continue my loving relationship with my my boo Cat Williams and Mm -hmm. just came off nine and a half month tour with him Mm -hmm. he's back out now and I'm doing something else 
and um, just um, trying to uh, squeeze in a little motherhood in between there and maybe, you know, get somebody's son up in the room. So I had um, I heard you mention in an interview, you know, like you and Cat Williams came up together in Oakland. And when he, you know, began to take off, he reached back and, you know, and supported you and grabbed you and pulled you pulled you up. Um, I know that, you know, um, there was one tour that you didn't continue on with him, but, you know, he did pull pull you, you know, and support you. We did a tour 15 years ago, mm -hmm. right when he was still Cat in the Hat. Mm -hmm. Chronicles okay. tour. And after that tour, we made a movie. Mm -hmm. I remember it. Called American Hustle. Mm -hmm. Very popular. Yes. So you can't ask for any more. You know what I'm saying? Like, right. I don't have to be thirsty after being given that gift because I played the largest rooms I'd ever played in my life with Cat. I hadn't done a bunch of theaters and I hadn't done any arenas then. And uh, for him to reach back and give me was just the greatest gift. Fast forward 15 years later, like I said, we just came off a nine and a half month tour me, him, Mark Curry, Red Grant, uh, Zoo Miller, um, Jen Thomas and Aaron Thompson. And uh, that's four people that I met in Oakland. Mark Curry's from Oakland. Mm -hmm. I met Red Grant in Oakland, met Kat in Oakland, myself. So it's like a full circle moment. Very much sense. so, very much so. Did um, Kat ever discuss with you, you know, why it was important for him to make sure that he supported you while he was on his trajectory? Not in so many words, but I think that he knew me, he respected my comedy, and he saw the same grinding gleam in my eye that he had in his, and he very much believes in female comics. He's always had females on his show, and he, you know, likes me loves me. Mm -hmm. I love him. So, you know, we never talked about why you, why you can't we get me? I'm so grateful. It was, I just is very, very grateful. Mm -hmm. The situation with Monique that had happened just um, with her, just as a black female comedian, um, when you were seeing all of that and even just the um, apologies that came in the end. Do you feel that Monique should have been supported more during that time um, when she was standing up for herself? Monique wasn't just standing up for herself. She was standing up for people like me. She was standing up for sisters in the game. She was making it plain and clear to everybody we do not get paid according to our worth. And that goes for any job actually, not just comedy. Um, I think that everything was personal. A lot of people say, don't take it personal. It was absolutely personal. People didn't like or respect her husband. They didn't like how she said things about Oprah. Don't talk about sacred Oprah and Tyler Perry. They didn't, um, they weren't ready, they weren't able to receive what was really going on because they had, it was wrapped up in their personal feeling. Everybody did it. People are lying if they say they didn't do it. Everybody was judging by her personal stuff and not really getting to the crux of what was going on. Cause you sort of have to do a deep dive to figure out everything that was going on. Right. I know um, a kind of like a parallel issue within the whole thing was the Netflix, you know, special and her feeling like she didn't she wasn't being offered the same amount of money as somebody like an Amy Schumer, you know. And um, so. So, yeah. Do you feel that, you know, since some time has passed, are you seeing black comedians get their just due in the business or do you think we have still a long ways to go? Well, I don't know if I'm going to get in trouble for saying this, but I do see more opportunities presenting themselves to certain comics that deserve a little shine. Mm 
But I don't know if that's Netflix's decision or Dave Chappelle's decision or Tiffany's decision because they're the ones who are bringing the people in. Netflix didn't go out and find Earthquake. Chappelle brought him there. Netflix didn't go out and find Flame Monroe. Tiffany brought her there. So I'm not... There's more opportunities being given. At the end of the day, Netflix has to say yay or nay, I guess. They're about to, you know, hopefully give me some attention. And I'll be very grateful for that. But Dave's bringing me to them. Mm -hmm. I've been here all the time. Mm -hmm. They have not offered me a Netflix special yet. Mm -hmm. But now I'm slated to have one. Mm -hmm. So, you know, let's give credit where credit is due. Most definitely. Well, um, just, you know, good vibes for the Netflix special that we about to see, Lunell, and we're going to speak it into existence. From your mouth to God's ears. <laughs> yeah. So why do you think Chappelle has been able to kind of like, you know, um, wiggle out of the cancel culture situation when folks were coming so hard on him for his comedy routines? Because he's telling the truth. The truth will set you free. You can't argue with the truth. And because he's likable and because he's not cooning for white folks, he's saying exactly what he want to say. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, too, maybe his fault, but he's just saying exactly what he want to say as if he's sitting talking to us. And I think that for the woke white folks that can receive it mm -hmm. for what it is, you can find the humor in it and learn a little something at the same time. So cancel culture is, to me, more generational. Mm. You know, that's the young folks with this cancel culture and going in virally spewing hatred of people, being keyboard gangsters and stuff like that. Right. Grown folk don't really do that. You know, hell, there's plenty of people we could have been done, done canceled, you know, mm -hmm. and, and didn't and maybe should have. But um, I think that's generational, so... Uh, okay. Dave gets, is grown. He's grown, grown. Yeah. He's, he's grown. And he talks to grown people. Mm -hmm. And grown people have discernment for themselves. Right. They don't really get influenced by social media like the young folk do. Well, one person that I don't feel has been able to wiggle out of the cancel culture thing is Ari Spears. You know, like after he made those comments about Lizzo... <laughs> He was basically lined up, you know, uh, for some previous comedy that he had did concerning children. Do you think that because the, the content had children in it, that that's why his cancel culture situation seemed to kind of have completely got him out the way or? Yes. Because it was because it had children in it. Do you think that? You know, the backlash and everything was appropriate for Aries and Tiffany. Being that this was many years ago. Right. I think she just got caught up in the windfall. She was collateral damage. Yeah. It was really Aries' video. And it was in poor taste. And she said she never saw the completed video anyway. Which sometimes we do do projects and don't see the whole thing. It's sort of your business to do that, though. You know, where's the clip? Where's the link? Let me see it. What happened? How, uh, how did it turn out? Right. But, you know, maybe at that time she didn't know to do that or didn't think she had the power to do that. I think Aries had had, had some incidents before mm -hmm. of, <laughs> as they say, maybe running off at the mouth. People didn't agree with what he had to say. Mm -hmm. All that said, he's super talented mm -hmm. and heck of funny. Mm -hmm. And was great on Mad TV and does the greatest impressions ever. But somewhere he got real dark and unfriendly. And not with me, maybe after today, but I don't know, not with me. But And uh, people don't like that. Mm -hmm. And when they don't like that, they probably don't like what you're doing. Right. And, and don't give them, give them a reason, you know what I mean? And that video was just the, and there was one after that too, you know, where he was kissing a man. <laughs> so there's that. Right, 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 right. In the, in the little, 
Speedos thing. At the yeah, end. the man sitting on his booty. Right. Hey, you know, hey, different strokes for different folks. If that's how Aries wants to do it. Well, if that's it. your stroke, claim it. Hey, yeah, claim it, that part. All right, definitely. Um, so before we close out, um, I want to touch on something funny that I found. I thought this was really hilarious on your Instagram page. Um, you getting a foot rub on your way back from a birthday party for Mickey Howard <laughs> by Darius McCrary <laughs> in the back of the SUV. Yes, and um, well, I'm I'm trying to get my foot rub. Like, you well, know, take your shoes off and put your feet in somebody's lap. <laughs> They'll probably rub them. If you have nice feet. Right. See, I have great feet. I mean, if you look at my toes right now, what they look like? Skittles. Mm -hmm. Brother, do my feet look great right now? <laughs> do I got toe rings? Got do I got pedicure? Yeah. You see any ash? I don't see no ash. Corns? Don't see no Bunions? Don't see no, <laughs> no, they look good. And yeah, you know, you got anybody would rub my feet. They sparkling? Yeah, all that. They're, they're amazing. Okay, so what tips do you give women on keeping their feet nice and smooth so that a man wants to, you know, rub on them? And Well, first of all, don't do it for them. Do it for yourself. You should have enough pride in yourself to keep your feet together. All right. This is L.A. We don't wear clothes and shoes a lot. We're always wearing sandals, toes, be out. But it really starts in childhood. Like, my mother kept me in good shoes. Mm. I wasn't... Uh, privy to wearing sneakers as a child. I had to wear them white, hard, ankle shoes, Oxford-type shoes that lace up that you get bronzed and stuff like that with your picture. And I do have my bronze shoes as a house, by the way. Mm -hmm. um, and my mother always told me, if you wear good shoes, you won't get those problems. Right. So they, I was kept in good shoes. As I said, I was raised in, you know, in the burbs. I, my parents was raised in a ghetto. I didn't have no ghetto ass parents. I had, my people had a little few coins. They worked mm -hmm. hard for them, but they did. And they kept me in good shoes. Mm -hmm. Then there was the, my period mm -hmm. where I had to buy my own shoes. A lot of them came out to swap meat and this and that, and they were not great shoes. Mm -hmm. But those shoes don't tend to last long anyway. Right. So when I started making some money, then I started investing in good shoes once again. Luckily, I hadn't been damaged by my swap me period, mm -hmm. and uh, I remain having amazing feet. Okay, definitely. Yeah, somebody told me that too. Is that um, at the swap meet? I was at the swap meet one day, and I was like, "Where's a good place to get some shoes up in here?" And she said, "Girl, you better not buy no shoes from the swap meet if you want your." They look good for they like photographs good. or maybe one night or. Mm -hmm. Up in the air. But they don't have that support but, that you need. <laughs> but you shouldn't go stomping around and swap me shoes mm -hmm. if you can help it. If you can if help it. If you can't it. help it, and that's the best you do, get them swap me shoes and rock out. Mm -hmm. And get your little callus thing. Okay, but um, yeah. <laughs> what age did you leave the home? Did you leave your parents' house? On my 18th birthday. Own it? Deuces. You could sound like you couldn't out. wait to couldn't leave. Couldn't wait. Okay, well, the parents, you know, they supported you. They had the finances. What what were some de some determining factors that made you say, you know what, at 18, I got to leave the nest? Because the man who raised me, mm -hmm. who was only my, he was not my father. I got adopted out of the family. I got seven brothers and sisters, but we weren't raised together. I was raised alone. They were raised in the South. The man who raised me was a raging alcoholic, very mean, verbally abusive and sometimes physically and I said on my 18th birthday I'm out this bitch sorry okay. and moved hmm. had been working since I was like 16 saving my little money on my 18th birthday I was gone of course I had to move back home <laughs> in about a month because I had a terrible car accident and I had to move back home you know, it don't all, you don't just leave out and everything cool. You never move back. Oh, right. sometimes that happened. That's not what happened to me. Mm -hmm. But after I healed up and got out, I never did come back home. Okay. And so uh, you mentioned, you know, you and, and your siblings being raised apart and, um, you know, being raised in the South. We're not talking about Arkansas South, are we? Uh, yes. Deep, 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 deep Arkansas. So I looked up the town that... And it's only a town. It's not a city, as you saw. It was like 200 people at the... At the Today. At, right, at the census. was. Yeah, and about 100 of them are related to me. 
What? Uh, so you were born in Arkansas? Born in Arkansas, my grandfather's house, not in a hospital. Mm. Had a midwife, the whole thing. Nice. Okay. And so where was this determining decision made that the kids got to get split up and sent to different families? The kids didn't get split up. Okay. Just me. But my mother had seven children was pregnant with me when her husband, my father, got murdered by her brother, my mm. uncle. So my my mother's brother killed her husband. And now it's like, oh shit, what do we do now? And she was living with her and to move back in with her parents who also had like five kids in the house and it's just poor, poor, poor rural Arkansas. And by some fluke, because out of bad things, good things come, Sometime, but my deceased father's sister, my aunt, and her other sister, my other aunt, and my mother were all pregnant at the same time, but they both lost their kids and couldn't have no more kids. And my mother had me. And I always thought, well, hell, you got seven kids to help you with me. Why would you give me away? But she did through circumstances that are still a little murky. I'm not sure the real, 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 real thought process. But she let my aunt and her husband Mm. adopt me in California. Now, of course, I resented that, resented her. Um, I was told about my brothers and sisters, and we did spend summers together. Of course, there was a little resentment there because I'm coming from California with a suitcase full of little shorts, outfits, and barrettes, and, you know, (laughs) sandals and little this and that and they down there struggling Mm. so there was you know a little resentment back then I believe rightfully so Mm -hmm. and I would have had rather been out there struggling with them Mm. than raised by myself but had I not been in California I would have never been exposed to the arts and the things that I was exposed to I would never got the chance probably to do what it is I'm doing I certainly wouldn't have the vernacular, the vocabulary, or the balls. Mm. Because, you know, that's just not how you are when you're raised in the South. You're a little bit more not so radical, a little bit more docile, I'll say. And some people may disagree with that, and that's fine. But um, that's, that's why I ended up in California. So all of that together, you know, it, it's definitely a lot. And I could um, I could see where some of the edginess of your comedy may come from. It's coming from a real place, um, of course. And so, but where would you say you pull most of your, your content for your comedy from? Like, where are some of your biggest sources of inspiration to, you know, develop your material? Out in these streets. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have to write anything. It writes itself. Mm. You know, from being in the airports and seeing stuff to being in the store to just looking at stuff on TV to listening to my daughter to, you know, I mean, I don't make up anything. I don't. Everything I talk about on stage is... true. That's why I don't really have a problem memorizing or remembering stuff, because it's true. Mm. If you write jokes and you have scripted comedy, then you have to memorize that like a script. And then everywhere you go, you're saying the same thing because you're following a script. Mm. But I don't do any two shows exactly the same. I don't know how. Wow. I just get up there and I just, I go. What would some advice you would give to a young up-and-coming female comedian, Um, in particular, you know, to somebody that is black and main, or, you know, just somebody that doesn't have the support or resources but feel that they want to be a comedian. What advice would you give? First of all, why? Why do you want to be a comedian? Why? Do you want to be a star? Do you got something to say? Do you want... Like, why? Why do you want to be a comic? Because I'm a purist, and I know, for me, it's like my church. I feel like you shouldn't do stand-up unless you feel like 
You're going to die if you don't do it. That's the way I feel. I don't often it, uh, throw out advice because I find that a lot of the young comics really don't want it anyway, and they don't listen to it, and they don't take it. If I give you some advice, I really want you to do what I said. And then if they don't, then, you know, I'm like, what did I waste my breath for? Right. But if I had to give some advice to somebody in the game or trying to be in the game, it'd be a woman and a black woman or brown. Mm -hmm. I would say um, be prepared for the struggle. If you love your parents and you like to spend holidays with them, this ain't the game for you. If you have children and you want to make all their important dates, this ain't the game for you. If you have a marriage and your husband's any type of insecure, don't like you around guys, this ain't the game for you. If you like to sleep a lot and you need eight hours of sleep a day, this ain't the game for you. If you're easily crushed and disappointed, you got thin skin, this ain't the game you want to play. And I feel like you have to be guy funny Meaning that you have to be so funny as a woman that guys want to come see you even without their girl. Because 90% of the time, guys who come to a comedy show with their girlfriend. But sometimes, if you're that bitch, guys will come see you like, yo, let's go see Liddell, partner. You know, she really be killing me like that. And you also need to know that you are not doing comedy for only black people. Yeah. You have to be able to do comedy for anybody. You have to be able to do clean comedy, raunchy comedy. If you get called to do comedy at the church, you need to be able to do that. If you get a call to go do Def Jam, you need to be able to do that. You're gonna do baby showers. You're gonna do birthdays. You're gonna do stuff you think is trash. You're gonna get beat out of your money. All that's gonna happen. So if you're ready for all that, Good luck. Well, Lunell, it has been an absolute pleasure to speak with you and to talk to you about your background in comedy. And we definitely will uh, make sure that we check you out at some point. It's your Las Vegas residency that starts November 6th. Congratulations again.